also available on our website, and um, you can always email the contacts that I'll have available um, uh, in the, on those slides to get in touch if you have any questions after the fact. So in Nevada State um, Publications Di Distribution Center was created in compliance with NRS 378180. Um, and it was created to collect all state, county, and municipal government publications intended for public usage. And we distribute them to designated depository libraries within Nevada. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, that'll work. So as you'll see up there, this is the actual, um, the actual statute chapter and section itself. Um, and that, as you can see, is a lot of words and a lot of reading. So I'm gonna just give you the nutshell version which what that basically says is that every state agency as well as county and city agencies are required by Nevada law to provide copies of their publications to the SPDC. And we will, I will go over later about what some of those are. Um, the documents must be in digital format unless they are only available in print, in which case uh, the state publications must pr be provided with 10 print copies and the county and city agency uh, documents must be provided with six copies. And if you have to send in print materials, the address is the Nevada State Library and Archives um, address on Stewart Street to the attention of the SPDC along with a form that I've added. Um, there's a, it's actually a kind of like a quasi link because it's not an actual link, but those print materials must have that form. However, the electronic version doesn't necessarily, doesn't need that form. And um, as I said before, they must be in digital format unless you simply don't have them in digital format, which some of our rural communities don't have um, documents that are digitized. So, um, and if you have a, the document that you wanna to send to us on a website that we can access, you can just send us the link and we will um, retrieve that. So you don't have to go through the process of actually sending it as an attached PDF. Um, if you don't have that um, in a, an easy way for us to access on our own, it just needs to be in a PDF as an attachment. But it's critical, and actually our government publications librarian reiterated this to me, so I'll reiterate it to you, that it's critical the print documents have the form. Because if they don't have the form, we can't do our process. So that'll hold up the publications getting distributed to the libraries and to uh, the Library of Congress that they're also dis distributed to. So to send or not to send, um, and that's probably, first of all, there's more things that you, will intuitively feel like you need to send that you don't necessarily need to send. Um, but there are three tests to determine if a publication is required to be sent to the SPDC. And if the answer is yes to any of those questions, then you want to send that publication to us. So the question is, is it published pursuant to the authority or at the total or partial expense of the state agency or local government? And is it required by law to be distributed by a state agency? Or is it distributed publicly by a state agency or local government outside the state agency or local government. So if it's something internal, there are a few things that you would um, possibly have internally that you would need to send to us, but most things that your agency is going to distribute just internally, like say a personnel manual, we don't need that. That's just for your internal operation. Um, so that's important to bear in mind. Um, some things that you might feel like you want to send that you don't necessarily need to is an agenda. Um, those would have already been distributed publicly because they have to be posted by another NRS that I can't remember off the top of my head. Internal memos, grant proposals, affidavits, none of that stuff needs to be send, sent. Um, however, if you have compiled codes or code changes, those do need to be sent. Um, any kind of environmental impact statement, including the draft, should be sent. Um, pamphlets and brochures, uh, financial reports, those need to be sent. And the financial stuff can get a little bit complicated because the financial statements and reports should be sent, but then there's other financial stuff like grant proposals that you have financial information on that it feels like you would need to send, but you don't. Um, and there is a much more comprehensive list of pretty much all this plus everything else that you should or should not send on our website. So you can always refer to that.
how we retain documents is they're first cataloged at the State Library, and we keep two copies. One is a circulating copy, the other is a non-circulating stored copy um, that would need to be accessed by a staff member. Um, and that's for preservation and also to keep a, um, a well-kept and preserved copy in good condition. Um, the cataloging documents create a record in our catalog that anyone can search for the materials owned by the library. Uh, and you can also access that catalog remotely on our website. So you can find this information again in our um, catalog remotely. Um, the catalog is recorded into an international catalog which is called um, OCLC or WorldCat, and that allows for the records to be shared globally. And likewise, this allows the State Library to uh, access records created by other libraries around the world. So that's a huge uh, bank of information. As you can see, there's 72,000 libraries in 170 countries um, that you can we can access information from for you um, upon your request. Uh, we were joking the other day, you could probably find anything that you need except something that's stored at the Vatican because they're not coughing that up. So just bear that in mind. If it's something, something in Vatican City, we probably can't get it. But otherwise, it's probably available somewhere. Um, cataloging also allows for keyword searching, um, and most of us know what that is at this point. Um, and if you don't ask, um, so there's things, the things that you can um, search by are the title, the author, the subject heading, the publication or creation date, the agency who published it, um, and then the classification class slash call number. And this would be, for those of, uh, of you who remember, this would be the Dewey Decimal System that we used to refer to in the library when we pulled out a card catalog. Now that's all done electronically, but it's the same concept. Um, where the item is, this, the, the call number tells us where the item is located on the library shelf, and it describes what agency created it. Copies of the documents sent to the library um, are also sent to the Library of Congress, and we also distribute them to uh, the other libraries in the state who then distribute those to their communities, and that's why we need so many print copies if um, it has to come in print form. And then digital publications are also cataloged and stored on our server, so we can hold those um, hopefully into perpetuity. So the benefits of the SBDC is that it creates and preserves a record of state and local government activity, and it maximizes our citizens' access to the state government publications that your agencies have produced. Um, it saves staff time for you guys by allowing you to refer public requests to us, um, and it allows us to curate and maintain access to born digital publications, so things that originally were in digital format, which is going to, as we move into the future, eventually be everything, we're guessing. And then this also improves transparency because you can always refer any public request to our website to find this information, so there's no secrets. Not that anyone's keeping secrets, but sometimes people think we are. Um, and then how you can access the documents yourself is through our catalog, as I mentioned before. Um, the easiest way to see if um, the document, or to find a document is, um, if it's by a particular agency, is to search for it by the agency. But the thing to remember about that is, if the agency name has ever changed in the course of the history of the agency, you'll need to know when the document was produced and if it was under the old name or the new name. So for example, as I say there, um, NDAO uh, will not find documents that were created under Department of Fish and Game. So it's important to know that. But we can help you with that too. If you don't know what an agency used to be called, we can find that out for you. Um, and one pro tip that we um, like to give is that when you're looking in the catalog um, and you're doing your title search, for example, um, way, one way to refine that is to use the right sidebar in the catalog. You may not have a point of reference for that now, but if you go and pop into the catalog, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, and then, of course, you can. there's a subject or a section where you can look just for electronic resources, and that's what, where you'll find the digital materials. And from there, you can really distill and whittle down your search. Um, and we're actually in the process of, of um, integrating a new discovery catalog through OCLC. So if any of you are interested in being a beta tester for us, please go into that link and check it out and tell us what you think. And this will help us provide better services for you guys as well. So that's really what we exist for is to assist the state agencies in their research and your, and your work. And um, so we wanna be able to uh, adjust and tweak this new product to your needs.
And then finally, if you have any questions, you can call our government publications librarian, who is named Kelly Robinson, and she um, really is the creator of this slide uh, presentation. I'm the deliverer, and I did some, I did fancy it up a little bit. And then Amanda Conkin is our state documents library technician. Um, she's actually gone for the next few months. She just had a baby. So Kelly would be your better uh, option, or you can also email me at jholt.admin.nv.gov. Or you can just email our state pub's um, email address or visit our website. And that is the end of my presentation. Do you guys have any questions for me? No? All right, if you think of anything post-meeting, feel free to contact us and we will are more than happy to help. All right, thank you. to jump right into, I'm gonna see if this works. No, of course not. I tell you, technology, you know, we got here a half hour early to, oh, it's not even plugged in here. Oh, it disables the mouse pad, so. Well, we don't need that maybe right now. There we go. So, take you through a little bit here what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to go through what's actually defined as a record. We're gonna talk about records retention and its dispositions. Some of the challenges that you have um, keeping your records as local governments. And we're gonna talk about when a record is an asset and when a uh, record becomes a liability. A lot of people think, oh, I'll just keep it forever, that way I have it. But there is a balance to when a record is useful for you and it's going to give you value to your agency and help you out, and then there is a time that becomes a deterrence for you and more of a headache and can actually cost your agency money. So the first thing is, is a lot of people think that a record is only that physical piece of paper that you have in your hand, that you go to the filing cabinet, you pull out that drawer and you put it in a file folder and then you go right back to where you put it to find it again. But a record can be in any form. And it's important to know that Nevada doesn't recognize, really, for retention purposes, the form or the media of the record. So if it's electronic, if it's paper, if it's social media, if it's email, if it's a photograph, if it's a map, none of that matters. We care about the content. What is the value of the record? What does it hold? What does it state about the business of your agency? So we're gonna get just a little philosophical on you here. 
Did an event ever happen if there is no record or memory of it? Right? So if, if this happens today, no one took down notes, no one took a memo, no one put it anywhere, who's going to know who's going to remember? So our records provide the continuity for our agencies. We all have those people in our offices who've been there 30, 35 years. They put the piece of paper where it was supposed to go, they filed it, they remember what happened, they can, you know, trick it off from memory and, and help you out. But what happens when that person walks out the door? It's all gone. So records keep that tracking history for us. And a lot of people think that records retention is so easy to put on the back burner. I don't want to think about destroying my records. I don't want to think about organizing it. You know, most of us wear so many different hats at our jobs that thinking about where things are filed and should I be throwing them away is so easy to put at the bottom of the priority list. But when you think about it, and it comes legislature session, it comes time to write those budgets, or the head of your agency needs something, who's the first person they call? It's always their records people. Hey, I need that memo from such and such. I need a copy of that budget report that we submitted in this year because I've got to be preparing again. Without us keeping those records, without us knowing where they are so we can find them again, our agencies are not functioning. So it's important that we keep those records available and consistent so we can find them when we need them, and we don't want it cluttered up with those records we no longer need. So as a record, again, records are information recorded in any format. When you're asking yourself what's the retention of a record, don't say, hey, I have an electronic copy. Always ask yourself, what's the content of the record? Records are created in the normal course of business. You receive them for action you have to do, and they're needed to document your agency's activities. So NRS 239.125 um, gives you your statutory requirements to um, your program management, and you're going to have to forgive me for just a little bit. This is where Jerry is a little bit more um, adept at <laughs> your requirements than I am. But it does say that for your records management program, <clears throat> any records retention uh, that you do must be approved by the administrator of the State Library Archives and Public Records. We do have the state manual online that you're allowed to use. And if you care to adopt that, rather than having to write all your own and work with Jerry to get everything approved, it's out there and ready for you to use. And if you are using the retention schedules that, have all, that are in the manual itself, those have already been approved, so you do not need to submit those to us. So if, if you should choose to keep things a little longer for your business needs, you can do that. You do not need our approval to do that. We have the statutory authority to create the minimum retention period. So, I mean, that's, that's another thing because I do get questions from agencies and from local governments about, you know, they'll want to submit something that is straight out of the manual to us for approval, and you really don't need to do that. It's already been approved. So uh, if, if you formally adopt the retention schedules in the local government records management program manual, a real long name for, uh, for that, um, those would then become your record retention schedules. So. Any questions on that? Hopefully. I might have pop up here just in case we need to interact. Okay, so NAC. So that this, this gives you the authority to dispose of your records. You do not um, have to contact us and ask for permission. If you're destroying your records in accordance with the approved records retention schedule, that is your legal authority to dispose of those records. You don't need any further authorization from us. Okay, what's an official record? Anything that is created and maintained in the course of business. So this is straight out of NAC giving you some examples. Um, documents, papers, ledgers, maps, charts, blueprints. 
This isn't inclusive or exclusive. So again, when you're asking yourself, is it a record or not? Did I receive it in the course of business? Is it necessary for me to track what my business is doing? Do I need to take action on it? Ask yourself all those kinds of questions. Didn't switch. Um, so then we have non-records. Non-records can be disposed of at any time. You do not need a records retention schedule to get rid of them. So as Joy was talking about, published materials, although they're required to go to the library, they do not have, a have, excuse me, have to have a retention schedule. So they're considered non-records as a retention schedule. Once you transfer them to the, to the library and archives for permanency, you can get rid of them at any time you don't need them. Uh, informal notes you don't need, brochures, newsletters, magazines, um, drafts, most of your drafts. If you're doing a report or a letter, we only want the final copy. Everything else you can destroy. Just keep the end product. One thing, one thing Sarah, the only caveat there is if you bring a draft up in a public meeting, it has now become a record. So that's, that's just one thing to be cautious of. Thank you. Um, convenience copies. This is where a bulk of your records are gonna come from. So if you make a record, you create a supply request and you send it off to your boss for final signature, your boss sends it off to the administrative assistant who's actually gonna process it, each one of you have kept a record. Only one of those, the final end product is actually the official record that needs to be kept per retention. Everybody else's are convenience copies. You have them because it's easier for you to have them at your fingertips when you need, what did I order last year? What am I gonna order again? What was that number? How much was it? But those should not be kept longer than the official record. Absolutely not, it's gonna create a uh, litigation nightmare if you keep those longer than the official record and you can get rid of them at any time. They are considered non-records. So as soon as you don't need those copies, clean them out. Get your drawer um, straightened out. Anything else? Ad hoc reports. That's a big one. So if you've been asked to create a report, budget season's coming up, uh, political season's here, and they want statistics, but you have to go to this database and that spreadsheet and out to that website, to gather all the data to get your final report. The final report is your record. That's the only thing that has to be kept per retention. Everything else that you pulled from to gather and all the little reports you had to get, non-records, you don't have to keep them. As soon as that final report is done, you have what you need, get rid of all the extra stuff. Any questions on records, non-records? Tell you guys, come on, a smile, some interaction here. <laughs> can we have a question? Absolutely, please. Uh, can you decide as an organization that a video recording of an event is not a record? Your video recording can be considered a record. It depends upon what the video recording is. So if we are recording this event today as a training, it's not a record. It's more of a publication, more of a distribution. If you're recording an open meeting, an open government meeting, something like that, then absolutely it does become a record and it absolutely has to be kept per the official retention. So again, it's the content of the video that's gonna decide whether or not you need to keep it. What if it's a recording of a court procedure? The, court, the courts have their own retention schedule. So if they are recording it there, they're gonna keep that as evidentiary, they're gonna keep that as a process towards their own recordings. Um, Is that true with local Yes, um, we, we don't have uh, statutory authority over the judicial branch, so that's where we, we can assist them if, if they ask us, um, but we do not have authority over them. So that would, that's really a question best asked of the administrative office of the courts. They, they should be able to answer that for you. But an excellent question, thank you. 
Anybody else in Las Vegas or here with questions on that one? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so mine popped up here. So if you're thinking about, is this a record? Should I be um, keeping it? Should I have a retention? Is it a non-record? Bottom line is always treat it as a record if you're not sure. We don't want you going to records jail because you destroyed a record too early. Nobody wants that, right? Because we all know we have to keep it the minimum amount of time. So when in doubt, call state records. Call us, give Jerry a call, send him an email. We'll help you look at that document, we'll help you understand its content. If there's a retention that already exists, we're gonna help you find it. And if not, Jerry will work with you to make sure that we create something that applies to it. So you do have authorization to get rid of it. One of the biggest confusions that I have when I teach these classes is people think if it's not on a retention schedule, it doesn't exist so I can get rid of it whenever I want. And it's the exact opposite. If it's not on a retention schedule, you don't have authorization to destroy it, so you have to keep it forever and ever. That's where you need to work with us. Let us help you get a retention. Let us help you do that research to find the appropriate amount of time to keep it so that you can get rid of those records you no longer need. And as Jerry mentioned earlier, we do set the minimum retention. You can keep it longer if your agency deems it necessary. Again, you just gotta find that balance between asset and liability, which we'll go over. We recommend that you don't file non-records with official records. When it comes to cleaning house and doing your dispositions and getting rid of your records, it's good to know where just your official records are and that everything else is a non-record. So that, and then when you go to find records, you're not having to go through extra paperwork. You have just what you need. Anything else? Perfect. So we gave you a little decision tree to ask yourself, is it a record or is it not? So if you go through, ask yourself yes or no, follow that through, it'll help you decide. Yes, that's something I need to keep, gotta figure out what the retention is, or nope, it's not a record, I can go ahead and get rid of it whenever I need to. So again, these are on our website if you didn't find them before the class, so once you leave, feel free to go out there, make as many copies of these as you need, and, and use them for reference. So that kind of winds up our section on what is a record, what's a non-record. We had some excellent questions from Vegas already. We have one here. So we have a, a question here in Carson City who's asking about Scantron forms in particular. And her question is, once they're scanned and uploaded and she has an electronic version, do you have to hold on to the hard copy? And the answer is absolutely not. NRS 719290 states that an electronic copy is as good as the original. So as long as you do everything humanly possible, make sure it's an exact replica, you can destroy it as soon as it's, as I would recommend making sure your backup cycle went through on your, your server to make sure it's all good, but after that, you're free to destroy it. Excellent, anything else before we move on to retention? All right then, I guess I'm just that good. All right, so every record has life cycle management. You create that record, it's born. You have its useful life. There's that period in time where that record is active and needed. Then there's a period of time where it's not active, but you're still retired, required to keep it. And that's called its retention. Then comes its disposition. So after you've met that retention time period, you can either destroy it. You can either throw it in a recycle bin or shred it. Then there's that three to 5% of records that are actually deemed permanent. That uh, either per statutory requirements or because of the history associated with it, the financial, we need to keep that. 
as a record of what the state has done at that period of time. So that life cycle management becomes a key player when we talk about records retention. As trustees of the state and um, its records and information, it's our obligation to make sure that the records that we create are available throughout that entire life cycle. When we work with you to create these retention requirements, we research federal requirements, we research state requirements, we talk to you <clears throat> and ask you, what are your business needs? Are you audited every two years, every three years? Are there any investigation processes that we need to know about? We wanna know your best practices. You are in your offices, obviously, more than we are. You are the knowledge experts. You're the ones to say, hey, I go to that drawer at least three times a year for four years. We need to know that when we're helping you. We're also gonna look at other states. We're gonna kinda reach out there, do some research, and understand why they keep their records as long as they do. All that comes into play when we help determine <clears throat> your retention schedules. Then after that, we highly recommend consistent and systematic retention of your records. So this helps you with public records requests and subpoenas. If you destroy the same types of records at the same time every year, you are completely within your legal authority to tell anybody who asks for it, it has been destroyed per retention. If you're not destroying that, you have to give that information up. So that's gonna cost you time and money when it comes to public records requests and subpoenas. Now, if you are getting subpoenas and you do go to court and you have some information but not other information, the courts do not look favorably on that. They tend to look at that, that you're intentionally hiding information from them. So instead of taking you at your word, that oh yeah, they've been destroyed per retention, they're gonna send you back to your office to have you do more digging. Because they're wondering why some records are destroyed sometimes, and others are being destroyed, but not consistently. But if you can show documentation, beginning of the fiscal, beginning of the calendar, we destroy consistently and systematically, the courts are gonna go, okay, we believe you. We understand that you do this all the time. Most likely they're not gonna ask you to go back and do more research. So it's gonna save you a lot of time, it's gonna save you a lot of money, and by making sure you just have your official records and you just have the ones that are still in their active life cycle, you're gonna save so much on your lawyer fees, because it's that much less that they have to go through and research and catalog and be ready to present. Big cost saver being consistent and systematic. So balancing your assets and liabilities. Just ties in what I just spoke about. So if you are making sure that those convenience copies are destroyed, in accordance and not, you know, when you no longer need them and they're not kept longer than their official documents, and you're making sure that you're doing consistent and systematic destruction, that only your records that are in their active life cycle are available, your agency will be at its prime. You'll be able to access the information when you need it, you'll be able to find it when you need it, and you're not holding on to superfluous information. The longer you keep those records, the more of a liability they can come to you. Because if that's that one piece of paper 20 years ago that somebody needs and you're still hanging on to it, you have to go find it and you have to provide it. Another thing that I just recently learned literally in like the last two months is that if you have a natural disaster at your agency, it's flooded, you have to go through and pay to have those records recovered before you can decide if they've been past retention or not. So let's say 50% of your documents should have already been destroyed, but then you had a flood in the basement of your office. You now have to pay a company tens of thousands of dollars to come in and try to restore those documents back to a level where you can make sure that, yep, those are the ones I should have already destroyed. Get them destroyed when they need to. When they're up to the retention, clean them out.
Okay, so we've kind of already covered this a little bit. Um, when you're looking at your records, ask yourself those questions. What is an, uh, an official record? Is it something I need to keep? And then ask yourself, make sure you know the retention that goes with everything. As soon as it's obsolete, as soon as it's met its retention, move it on to its next step of life, whether it's shredding, destroying, uh, recycling, or moving it on to um, a permanent retention state. This is a copy of our website. So if you go to nsla.com, .gov.com. See how often I go there? It's on my homepage. I never even type it in. But um, records right there in the center. And then, oh, there you go. NS, well, I want to say libguides.com, but if you type in nsla.com, it should redirect you automatically. And then on the bottom there, you can see local government. There's our hours of operation, our contact information. So if you need to find us um, after we leave here, uh, here's all the information to navigate you there. I'm gonna let Jerry take over a little part of this. This is, this is where he uh, helps you guys out. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about the retention schedules. Um, the retention schedules are actually part of the manual, which is just a, a basic, gives some basic records management uh, guidance. And they're separated on the webpage just because there's so many retention schedules actually. Um, this is a, a, uh, just a copy of the, the manual itself. This will be being updated, and I hope to have everything completed by the end of the month. That's kind of my goal. This, once again, is just a uh, shot from our webpage. The, uh, the schedules are broken down into one 300-plus page schedule, and then also by their functionality. So if you, if you click on the, uh, the tab, in sort of the middle of the page, that will take you from the administrative records all the way down to zoning. So basically you can kind of, it's, it's a little easier to navigate. Oh, okay, is this better? Okay. And, and this is just once again, uh, this is sort of the, uh, the shot of the functional list. And uh, as I was saying, these will be updated at the end of the month. The elements of the schedule. We have what we call an LRDA. And all that is is, is really it's just a unique identifier that uh, each record series have. And it, it stands for Local Records Disposition Authorization. The schedules themselves then have a description a retention period, and then there's also, um, I, I try and put all the legal citations that may be applicable, and then there's a note field and a disposition on those, and we'll, we'll, we'll see a, a copy of a schedule in just a couple of minutes here. And we're looking for three elements. We're looking for an event, which is the trigger that determines when the record becomes inactive. We're looking for the time period, which is the length of time the inactive record must be held before disposition. And then we're looking for an action, which is what happens when the time period is met. So here's, here's just an example of this. This is uh, retain these records for a period of three calendar years from the end of the calendar year in which the grant application was closed or denied, and then the dis disposition is destroyed. So we have the time period, we have the event, and then we have the action. And then there's, these are just some different examples of events. So we can have a, uh, some records are closed at the end of the calendar year. Some are closed at the end of a fiscal year. Some, uh, such as case files, may be closed when uh, the case is closed. So that's, that would start that retention period. Some are superseded. And then we do have those ones that are considered permanent records that you cannot destroy. 
And this is a copy of a schedule. So we have uh, a title, which in, on the top one here, if you can see that, is accident reports. We have a, a description, and that's not all inclusive. There may be some things in there. That's why I always try and put may include, but is not limited to. Um, then we have the minimum retention period. We have legal citations, which is part of the reason why they're kept for that length of time. In this instance, um, it's, it's very difficult to see, but it's, it's actually based on the statute of limitations. And then there is a legal note, which is the same as disposition. Basically, you know, whether this should be, if it has confidential information, if it should be shredded, or uh, if it's an electronic record, if it should be uh, swiped, or, or however you would go about getting those destroyed uh, in a confidential manner. And then there's also a note, and that's, not all records will have those, but in, in this instance, there is a note field there, so. And here's some important things to know. Uh, we've talked about this already, destroying compliance with the, the destruction, instruct, or the destruction instructions. Uh, if your records do not fall on a series on any schedule, it cannot be destroyed. Format does not matter, content does. And retention periods are not suggestions. And this is just a little bit on the maintenance up and updates. I do the local government schedules following the legislative session because then we know what laws have changed, what the leg legislature has gone on, what uh, we've gone through that process. So it takes, uh, that's why we have that kind of lag time because it's, I'm waiting until things are codified and they are published so that we know that the what we originally saw in the bill is actually what's going to end up in law. And then I start my process of updating those. And that process takes anywhere from six to nine months because I give opportunities for local government to, to let me know, this is what I'm proposing, what do you think about it? You know, to kind of go through that process. Because we don't store local government records in our record center. I want to make sure that this works for you and complies with the law. So we want to, you know, I want to cover that. For your own schedules in your, in your individual agencies, if you're adding things uh, to your programs or they're being modified, eliminated, something like that, that's probably a real good time to go ahead and, and look at your retention schedule. Um, also, if, if you're aware of changes in law or regulations, it's real good to let me know. Generally, I'm going to find that and I'm going to know it, but if, if you're a subject expert on the records that you have in your office, if you know something has changed, please reach out to me and let me know so we can get that taken care of for you. And then um, if you're consolidating records or, or programs, if things are kind of uh, going, you're moving things along from one program to another, that's another good time to look and say, hey, are we still creating these records? Do we still need these on our schedules? And then talking about consolidating records, I'm trying to do more and more of this, where it may not seem readily apparent, but uh, um, trying to get with bigger buckets so we don't have so many individual record series. And that's uh, one of, this is kind of the theory behind that. You have, you know, you have four different closely related RD, LRDAs. We'll put those into one bucket. So such as accounting files, the office copy of that. Um, so you could have a whole list of things from bank statements to uh, cash reports, um, billing claims, things along that line. They all sort of fall under that one uh, record series. And then if you want to request changes, we actually have a form on our website that you can utilize for that. Um, and you can send those to me at any time. You don't need to wait for the two-year cycle. What I'll do is I'll, I'll keep those, and once I start my update cycle, we'll go ahead and take care of it. 
This is just a copy of the form. And then we're gonna talk about, Sarah's gonna come back and talk a little bit about records disposition. Any questions for Jared before, I mean, he's not going anywhere, but nope. he still has the mic on your specific LRDAs. Okay. All right, well, thank you, Jared. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, not, yes, you're you're welcome. <laughs> All right, this is Earl. I don't know if any of you have been to our record center, but this is our large, um, volume shredder. And when we went through to do the first bit of shredding in our office, the box that they happened to pull had the name Earl written on the outside of it. So we actually cut it out and, and taped it on there. So everybody in the building now knows if you need something shredded, go ask if Earl's available. Okay, so why should you dispose of those records? Well, obviously it's gonna be some cost avoidance for you. You're gonna free up office space. If you have physical records, you're not gonna need as many filing cabinets. You're not gonna to have to purchase more filing cabinets. And if you're deleting your electronic records, it's gonna save on your electronic space. Uh, it's gonna re reduce your research time. So again, if you're not going through unnecessary stuff, uh, you, you're gonna find your records faster. It's, I don't think we put it in here, but it's estimated that 50% of the records that we create and the records that we maintain are what I lovingly call the crap we don't need, right? So if you have all those people keeping the same copy of that invoice that you sent out, but you only need one, why are you keeping it? Why are you having that storage space in your drawer or on your filing in your, um, your, your personal drive or out there on your share drive and having to go through, oh, nope, don't need this right now. Get rid of it. It'll save you up to 50% or more sometimes of your storage space. It's gonna allow room for those new records. We create, and I don't think the slide's on here either, and I forget the number, but we create so many new records per year. Oh, okay, he says it's coming along in a little bit here, so I'll cover it when they get there, when they get to big data. So, but it also makes sure, and this is very important, if you're following your records retention schedule and you're getting rid of what you don't need, that the records you do need to keep are being preserved correctly and your historical records are not accidentally being thrown away. So on the retention schedules, you're gonna see um, destroy, destroy securely, or permanent. So destroy means that in our research, we have determined that there's no confidential information, no personal identifying information, nothing that can't be recovered inappropriately. So it's okay just to throw those in a recycle bin and, and, and let the, the service take care of recycling it for you. Secure destruction means that we've determined there is confidential information and it must be destroyed in a manner that will prevent it being um, reconstructed. So the big question that we get is, what about electronic? Well, if it's, if it's not confidential, hitting delete button and waiting till the computer does whatever it's gonna do is perfectly fine. But if it's confidential information, you gotta make you sure that you work with your IT staff to take the extra step. What we recommend and we work with our uh, IT team is that we have one place that says secure destruction. And then we move all our stuff over there when it's time, say our calendar year. And then we call them and say, hey, this folder's ready. And then they can run their program that goes through and make sure it's completely written over so it can't be recovered. So it's very important that your secured destruction applies to your electronic information as well. Because we all know, we all watch the CSI shows where they take the hard drive, right? And they go and they find the stuff from 20 years ago, this letter that nobody intended to ever be seen again, and it's still there. So we gotta make sure that that's properly destroyed. Let's see, we just covered that, that's the NAC that talks about making sure your um, records are destroyed properly. We like to give you these NACs because if you go back to your office and you're telling your boss, hey, I just went to training, they said this is what we have to do, someone go, uh-uh, we're not doing that. But you can go back and say, hey, look, it's very clear. The NRS, the NAC tells us exactly what we need to do. And I can't stress this enough. Convenience copies versus official records. 
get rid of the convenience copies as soon as you don't need them. But it is absolutely vitally important that you do not retain them past the official record. So I was the records officer at NDOT. And we got subpoena ducas tecums all the time. I mean, they think NDOT, you have the money, right? So we're gonna sue you for everything you got. Many times, I would respond to the subpoena, that record's been destroyed per retention. Well, there's 1,500 employees at NDOT. If that opposing team, that litigation side, knew which employees worked on whichever product, project that they were uh, suing about, they would subpoena that person and want their records. Well, according to me, the official record was destroyed. I didn't know that, that person still had it on their hard drive or they still had it in their drawer. So that person would have to go to court and sit on the witness stand and say, I'm here costing my agency more money and time, headache and heartache because I'm a hoarder. I don't want that to be me. <laughs> so that's why it's so important that you and your staff get rid of those convenience copies as quickly as possible. My recommendation, and I know it's easier said than done, is to get a shared drive. Have it set up with your different folders. This is a folder for correspondence. This is a folder for open meeting law. And then you have it set up by date. So everybody knows that's where the official record is stored. If there is a copy anywhere else, it's automatically a convenience copy. You know you can get rid of it because you know where the official record is. Then when it comes time for destruction once a year, everything's in the same place. Grab it, put it to its next step, move on. And if you need it for litigation, if you need it for public records request, if your boss calls you for something, you know exactly where it is, okay? There are some exceptions. If you have an audit, an investigation, litigation, or you know that litigation is coming, it's impending, you know it's on the way, the subpoena is coming, but it just hasn't hit your door yet, or public records request, all dispositions must be put on hold. Once whatever action has been completed, that audit's been closed, the investigation's done, court case is done, then the disposition can be put back into effect. So if it's due to be shredded next week and you get a public records request, it's not okay to say already been destroyed. <laughs> as much as you want to, um, you can't do that. Everybody remember Enron and Arthur Anderson, their accounting firm that helped them out. You know, they were fudging the numbers, making things not quite right. Well, Enron knew and Arthur Anderson knew that the subpoena was coming. So they looked around their records and they said, oh, those should have been destroyed. Those should have been destroyed and those are gonna be next week. Let's just destroy them now. So they started shredding. FBI got the subpoena, starts walking up their front steps. What did they do? They bought bigger shredders. Well, we all know that Enron no longer exists and Arthur Anderson no longer exists because you just can't recover from something like that. So it's very important. Everybody jokes when I say records jail, but it's a thing. <laughs> you can have up to a class C felony if you destroy records early. So make sure you understand what your retention schedules are and make sure you understand if there's litigation or something going on that you're holding and ready for it. Any questions? God, I'm good. I'm really good here. Okay, so we understand that disasters are gonna happen. There's natural disasters, poor storage, human error happens as much as we want to avoid it, we know it happens, man-made disasters. If that happens, document, document, document. Notate the dates, notate the types of things that were destroyed. Take any photographs you can. And then if there's uh, availability for remedial action, we can put you in touch with firms that can help you recover documents if needed. Call the archives, call us. There's agency out there ready to do it. But most importantly, 
you want to be able to say, if anybody asks you for those records, look, we have documentation that they were destroyed at this date because of this reason. We don't want anybody claiming that you aren't able to provide those records because you're trying to hide something. All right, the world of electronic records. There is actually a person in there. I don't know if you can see it, but right behind that glare on their screen, you see a dark little spot there? There is a person in there. And if you look hard enough, I think there's actually a shredder in there somewhere too. But if we take what this looks like physically and move it to the world of electronic records, it's a mess out there. How many times do you create a document, you save it, next day you come in, you're like, where did I save it and what did I call it? I can't find it. It's the same thing. It's just you can't see it, so it's easier to forget about it. But the same process applies to electronic records as it does to our hard copy records. We don't want to be buried alive. You don't want your electronic world to be like that show on TV where they have this tiny little path to get to the kitchen, to their bedroom, and to the bathroom. And then you can't find anything else. So that brings us to the world of big data. 90% of the data that was created in the world was created in the last two years. Two years from now, we're gonna be saying the exact same thing. That is how much electronic data we are creating every single year. And if you remember what I said, 50% of that is the crap we don't need. So how do we get around that? Well, first we have to understand what big data is. It's closely associated with unstructured data and large data sets that are difficult to find. So, it, but you gotta understand that it's not just unstructured and it's not just structured. I'm just, I'm not a, okay. So WTF. We all know what that means, right? Where's the file? Where did I put it? <laughs> he needs it, I created it, what the heck did I do with it? Well, structured data is things like an access database, it's an Excel spreadsheet, it's if you have application extender or something, records management system like that, it's something that you could put a query on. Something where you can define what you're looking for, enter in a word, and it's gonna help you locate what you need. Unstructured data is everything else. So you have your little file tree, and you create your spreadsheet, you create your access database, you create your Word document, you name it something that's so cute and meaningful and you'll be able to find it, but then you can't. So, but if you take that one step further, I've now created an access database, I've now created a spreadsheet, which is structured data, but I file it the same way I just did my Word document and I put it out on my server with all the rest of the unstructured data. Now I can't find it either. So it's up to us to structure that data, to make sure what we're keeping and making sure that we're putting it in a way that it's searchable and retrievable. So again, Identifying that same mountain of junk, redundant, duplicated, incomplete, and corrupted data as early as possible in its life cycle and getting rid of it is another, frankly, more sensible way of managing information. Not my quote, but it makes sense. The earlier you get rid of something you don't need, the easier it's gonna be for everything else later on. Aaron, here it is. The debris, the 50% of the stuff we don't need. So the challenges for you as local governments. You have large amounts of data. You have a pretty complex record schedule. I review it, I look at it every once in a while, I try to help some of you find what you need. There's a lot of stuff out there. And we try to keep it as simple as possible because we know the harder it is to find what you need on there, the less likely anybody is to be able to use it or going to use it. We know you have outdated systems. We know you have limited resources. And this next one doesn't apply to anybody. We all have unlimited financial resources, right? 
No, we know that doesn't happen. Our tightening budget, and then the political. Every time we have an election like we did last week, the administration changes for us. Their ideas of what we should be doing and how we should be functioning changes with that. And we're expected to go with the flow. So the more standardized, the more baseline you have all of this, the less these things are going to affect that. And I know you guys have unique needs. You're mandated to provide access to public records and you need to secure those um, from disclosure. And we need to recognize that your IT needs are different. Our IT needs are different. So we just gotta make sure that what we apply to our physical records, we're applying to our electronic records. There's no difference in the retention or the way you store them. We know you have public records laws that you have to look at, you have open meeting laws, and records retention laws. Now, we come to these trainings, and a lot of times I sit out where you are, and everybody spouts what the problems are to me. I already know what my problems are. I'm here to help get help. How do I resolve some of those issues? When we wind this up a little bit, we're gonna give you some helpful steps that you can take back to your office and hopefully implement, because when you have records retention, you have offices that haven't been kept up, it's overwhelming to see all that paper, to know that all that electronic is out there. How do you even start to bring it under control? How do you get it to where you need to be when there's so much out there? We're gonna try and help you with that. But first, let's talk, you've got mail. And we can add to this, you've got social media. All of these are issues that are happening right now and they're overwhelming. People ask all the time, it's a very big question that we get all the time, how long do I keep an email? How long do I keep a social media record? Is this any of you? I don't practice what I preach, I'm an email hoarder. I use my Outlook email as a filing cabinet and I know I shouldn't. But here is the question. Tell me, who can answer in here? How long do you keep an email? Anybody in Vegas? Anybody in Carson? What's the answer? Absolutely, based on answer content. Here in Carson. And I didn't, was it Vegas? It is based, based on, on content. content. Very good, thank you. You're absolutely correct, based on content. So you, absolutely, it's no different than you go into your mailbox and getting an envelope, taking it back to your desk, opening up that envelope, reading the letter, and deciding, does it have to do with this project? Is it just regular correspondence? Is it a PINA? What is it? Once you understand what that piece of paper is asking for, you know where to put it. Email is no different. Our recommendation, you open an email, you make a decision, read it, put it where it needs to go. If you've created those shared folders like we talked about earlier, and that's on contract 1859, it's some questions about it or a decision on it, save it as a PDF, move it to that file. It's done. You don't have to look at it again in your email box. You know it's saved as an official record. And if you call in Rich tomorrow and don't come to work, somebody's gonna be able to find it when you're not there. So asking how to file an email, no different than asking how to file a piece of paper. The content determines the retention and its disposition. So we um, recommend, again, get those shared folders. Organize them by the record type and by the year, just like everything else. It's where you need it, when you need it, and when it's time to get rid of it, everything is in one place. I know easier said than done. So we recommend going back to your agencies and establishing a policy that says, for instance, for open meeting law records, we're gonna be storing them on shared drive S, folder open meeting law, and by date. If everybody in the department understands where this official record should be stored, 
Then again, you know everything else is a non-record because it's a convenience copy and everything is in one place. And it's being backed up appropriately, hopefully by your IT, so you don't have to worry about it being lost. Do your archiving frequently and consistently. Always be moving that stuff so it's always available. And again, the same decision tree that we gave to you earlier. When in doubt, ask yourself those questions. Is this really a record that I need to be keeping? If not, let's get rid of it right now. If it is, where do I need to put it? So we know as government agencies, we have to make sure that we're transparent and we have to make sure that our records are available for the public when they ask for them. And in the face of growing physical and electronic records, this becomes very difficult. So we need to look again to making sure we're keeping our records as long as they're an asset. So as long as they're easy to find when you need them, they're readable, they're secure and protected, that's a big deal. We had an agency come in to see us one time and he tells us that his records are in banker's boxes stacked in their hallway. And I went, okay, anybody could access them? Oh no, no, no. We have a receptionist and they have to sign in when they come in. I said, okay, where do they go from there? Oh, we escort them where they need to go. And if they have to leave to use the restroom or they go out to go to another place, well, yeah, that happens. So what you need to remember is, can you go to court, put your right hand up and swear that those records were never able to be accessed by anybody who didn't have a right to them? If you can't 100% say yes, you need to work on your security. Otherwise, they could have been tampered with, altered with, and you're not meeting your requirements as an agency to make sure they're secure and authentic. Um, making sure that they are destroyed when their retention is over, that you're consistently managing them, and that you're occupying as little space as needed. If you're meeting all of these, your records are still an asset to your, to your office. They become a liability when they're inconsistently managed, it creates legal challenges because the court assumes malicious um, destruction or contempt if you're not destroying the same things at the same time. If you can't find them, what good is a record if you can't find it? We all know that one. An average employee spends 11 hours looking for records. That's a lot of time going through things that don't need to be there to find what you need and unreadable. This doesn't just apply to the paper records that get worn out over the years, start being sun faded and you can't read them. You have to remember that they need to be migrated forward through the media. We've got a picture of a floppy disk up here. I bet you cannot find a computer anywhere anymore that's gonna be able to read whatever's on this floppy disk. So if somebody's asked for something, you hold up the disk going, yeah, we have it, but I can't get it for you. Same thing is true right now with CDs and DVDs. When you go down to the computer store to buy a new computer for yourself, how many of them come with a DVD or CD drive anymore? It's next to impossible. Everything's on the flash drive. Everything's on the external hard drive. What's the next step? So as you're looking at your records, you're looking at your data management programs, make sure you're migrating them forward so that when you need to access them, you have the right technology and the right format to be able to get to, get to them. You wanna make sure they're uh, protected from authorized access, unauthorized access, we just talked about that. And making sure um, records that you have, they're subject to disclosure, you have to give them up. So if you don't have them and you got rid of them appropriately per retention, Look how much time you just saved saying, already destroyed per retention versus it's gonna take me 30 days to gather all that information you need. And then hand it over to your lawyers who deem that 50% of that are copies. 
just keeping what you need, getting rid of it, saving you time and reproduction, effort and costs. Don't be a hoarder. Okay, so how does this help you? These are our helpful steps. Go back to your office. Step one, take an inventory of the type of records that you have and determine what is our official record. Number one, make sure you have that policy in place. What's my official record? Where is it stored? Number two, get rid of those convenience copies. Right there, 50% of the crop should be gone. Number three, look at your official records, go back to your retention manual, and figure out which LRDA number is associated with each one of those records. Once you know that, look at the records and determine which ones have already met their retention. How many of those records should have already been destroyed per retention? Get rid of the ones that are past retention. You no longer need them. Clean house, we're giving you permission. Get rid of them. Repeat consistently and systematically. If they're fiscal records, first week of July every year, have a pizza and sweats party. It's time to go out to the storage unit and throw away our records. If it's calendar, right after the Christmas holidays, let's clean things out. You're going to get at least 50% more free space. You're gonna have less time for research and you're gonna have less time for discovery. That's the end of our presentation, but I just wanna say, We do records retention every day, all day, while we're at work. That is our primary goal. We know you all wear many different hats. This is not the sole thing that you do every day. The one thing I want you to take away from here is you go back to your offices, don't pull out your hair, don't get all stressed, don't think I can't find what I need, what am I gonna do? Pick up the phone or send us an email. That's why we're here. We are your resource to make sure you have what you need. Give Jerry a call, he's unavailable. My card's on the back, Jerry's card's on the back. We're here to help you. So anything you need, just let us know. Any questions on anything before I turn it over to Heather? Absolutely, the question is, one of the frequent problems she has is which LRDA number goes with the document she's looking for. Call Jerry. He's familiar with those records, he writes them. If he's not for sure, he'll have you send you a, him a copy of it. We're gonna sit down and we're gonna research it. We're gonna help you find that answer. One thing I alluded to but didn't address is social media. And I know that's a big upcoming issue with a lot of us. From our aspect as the State Records Center, we recommend social media as an outgoing informational service only. We don't recommend using it as a communication service because then you have to worry about capturing it and making sure you're getting those screenshots in time of what's happening. So instead of doing that, if you have a, a website or a Facebook, direct your users back to your internal email. If you have a question, if there's something you need, you wanna make a comment, please direct it here because then you already have a process in place to capture the information. So that's our record on that, our recommendation. But again, if you do end up doing correspondence, if it does become an official record, look at the content. What were you talking about? What was being discussed? And use that to apply the retention. Las Vegas, any questions for me? Hi, yes, I have a question regarding audits and how, like, how are they performed, say, if you want to keep track of the other departments to make sure that they're keeping to the retention schedule? And if there's like a form for auditing? Um, we don't... An auditing process for doing it, for records. We as the state don't really have a quote-unquote auditing process. What I recommend for state agencies, we have our work performance standards. 
So I recommend for the people that are required to manage the disposition of records retention, that it's listed in their work performance standards that it's required. So then their supervisor and then on up the chain on their yearly evaluations, they can go in and look. Are these records being destroyed? Are they keeping up? Are they alerting uh, state records of any changes? And that way, it goes down the chain. No one person is in charge of auditing, but each section is monitoring that as it goes. Does that help? Okay. Yes, thank you. You're so welcome. Anything else? All right, well, I'm gonna turn it over to Heather, and she's gonna talk about what I lovingly call our hidden gems. There's so many functions at the state agency, at the library and archives, that we have available, like free training. If you ever wanna know that, give Jerry a call, give me a call. Any, um, anybody with a, a Nevada library card, free training, like all of the Microsoft Outlook products, how to build a resume, how to do interviews, if you need to go for your GED, all free, available to us. So we can give you extra information, but one of our hitting gems is imaging and preservation services. So Heather's gonna give you a little bit more about that. Thank you, Sarah. Like she said, my name's Heather. Um, I supervise the Imaging and Preservation Service. And um, first I'm gonna bounce off of what Sarah was talking about and big data. Uh, because recently I'm doing some research on big data and a Stanford study said that globally we are creating an exabyte of data every year. That's one million terabytes of data. That is a lot. And when you think about half of that is stuff we don't need, that's half a million terabytes of unimportant data is huge. So definitely something to keep in mind um, as you're working through your records management program. So, what is Imaging and Preservation Services, or IPS? Um, we offer digitizing and microfilming services to all of the state agencies and then all to the local government agencies. So our services is available to you. What we offer. So first are our scanning services. Uh, we provide large quantity scanning of paper documents using our, that's not gonna show up, in the bottom corner you see our Canon scanner. Uh, it's a uh, scanner that pulls documents in at a quick rate, um, docu uh, scanning pages in quick succession. Then the, the next thing that we're able to do is we can digitize microfilm and microfiche. So say your agency has records that are on microfilm or microfiche that you ha don't have a reader for anymore, but you wanna be able to access them on a more regular basis, then you can bring them to us and we will digitize them for you using our um, high def flex scan um, scanning system. We have the ability to photograph uh, the various sizes of photographic film, including large format, medium format, and 35 millimeter um, negative film, and also slide film. This is helpful for a lot of agencies who have a lot of historical photographs that are in different sizes and in different conditions uh, that we can digitize for you so that you can again, have access to them that's you know, quick and readily available. We also have the ability to digitize books. So you might have ledgers um, or publications that your department or agencies put out. And we utilize, it's a Zoichel book scanning system where there's two independent tables that um, are at the base of the scanner. The book gets placed on the two tables so they can move independently um, and accommodate for the binding 
than the piece of glass. This is the one in the middle. I feel it's kind of like the Brady Bunch, you know, squares. <laughs> um, it's the one in the middle to the right with the glass um, piece that you see uh, upright. That comes down, it flattens the book a little bit, and then we're able to take a nice, clean, flat scan of that book without damaging the binding or having to cut the binding in any way to, say, run it through a scanner. And then finally, uh, if you have large documents, blueprints, maps, yeah, anything that would have been printed above and beyond, you know, an eight and a half by 11 or a, a legal size piece of paper, we can scan documents up to 44 inches in width. So the, the scanner in the bottom right corner, uh, that is our context scanner, which can allow us to feed the document uh, through the scanner and we're able to give you a nice, clean, digitized copy of that large, some most, most of the times unwieldy document. The other side of our services is our microfilming services. These become important if you have records, for example, that have permanent retention. Like Sarah and Jerry talked about, with electronic records, you're constantly having to kind of stay on top of those and be concerned about their continued migration to make sure that you're able to continually access that information. The one nice thing with microfilm is you can access it anytime, even when, say, your computer systems are down. And if it's processed and stored properly, it can last between 50 to 500 years. So that's a really long time. Plus there's a little bit of cost savings when it comes to paper storage versus microfilm storage. Everybody's familiar with the banker's box. Most of us keep all of our records in that. If you take two banker's boxes, all of the records in there will fit onto one small little roll of microfilm. So when you start thinking about your storage space and how much money your agencies could be doling out in rent or what have you, anything that goes into continued document storage, this is gonna cost a lot less than storing multiples of these. Because the other um, conversion, which is really nice, 80, 80 of these fit into a banker's box. So you've now taken what would have been 160 banker's boxes, whittled it down to one box. That's a huge, huge savings when it comes to, to storage costs. With our microfilm, we offer two types of microfilm. We offer 16 millimeter, which tends to be for your regular eight and a half by 11 documents. We also offer 35 millimeter, which is slightly larger and uh, is usually used for newspapers or any large documents um, that would be really small when you're, when you're trying to look at them on the, the 16 millimeter. And then finally, um, one of the big additional services that we provide is large format printing. Uh, a lot of agencies aren't aware that we have this service available. And we recently got a new printer. We, we geeked out a little bit, had a little too much fun, got a new piece of equipment. Um, and we use an Epson P9000. What this allows us to do is we can print large format photographic quality images up to 44 inches in width and up to 100 feet in length. So I don't know if any of you noticed the banner that we have hanging over here advertising the library and archives. We printed that. So we can print banners. Um, in the back of the room, you might have seen uh, some of our other promotional um, posters that were printed. So we can print posters, print 
we don't tend to print flyers in mass quantity, um, but we can do announcement posters, banners, anything that you might need uh, in a large format to, to help advertise your agency or um, if you have historical photos that you don't want, say, original prints to be handled, we can make access copies for you or posters for displays or anything like that. And the value of using our service versus a commercial service, again, is cost savings. So I did a little breakdown and based on our current pricing schedule, if you were to digitize 250 images at our specialty scanning rate, which is anything other than an eight and a half by 11 document, that's 50 cents a scan, that would cost your agency or your department $125. Commercial services, depending on the size and quantity of what you're asking them to digitize could charge you anywhere between $13 to $80 per image. So you go from being charged $125 to potentially $3,400 to $20,000 for uh, digitization services, which to me is just crazy. Um, so that's a huge savings for your agencies. And the reason why we're able to do this is per NRS, we are only allowed to provide you services at cost. So at no point will we be providing anything to you for profit. It is literally only there so we can cover the expenses of our raw materials and uh, the setup that goes into getting a project going. The other example I have, and I'm gonna ask for a volunteer <laughs> from my table. <laughs> they're, they're actually right here, sir. <laughs> it's okay. So um, the image director, the Nevada Magazine, uh, was nice enough to give me a digital copy and this copy of a uh, print that they had done um, for uh, a publication. They went to Costco. Costco charged them $10 for a 20 by 30 print, photographic quality. <laughs> I know I, we need like the Price is Right music going on or something. We took that same digital image, printed it on our printer. It costs us and you a dollar eighty. So that gives you an idea of just the massive cost savings that your agencies could have by using our services. Um, and I, I do see some familiar faces in, in the group. So if you, if you already use our services, you know, please share your experiences uh, with, with others. And oh, does anyone have any questions? No. Bueller. No. Okay. <laughs> Um, so one more slide, hopefully he'll, he'll bring it back up for us. This is all of my contact information. Um, unfortunately, they haven't given me business cards yet. So um, my email is there, my phone number is there, and one of the important things that I wanna show you is our website, um, which hopefully that'll come up here in a second. If you are interested in starting projects with us, our website is the best place to go first because we have all of the forms that, well, I should say a form that you would need to get a project started with us. And then we also have examples of our annual service agreement, which is a 
a blanket agreement that um, we have with our customers, spelling out the different things that go on during the project process. And then I also uh, put up a little information about the next step in that process, which is the statement of work, which we draft up and is agreement between us and your agency about the specifics of a project. So there's no questions um, that, you know, down the line, hopefully that will stump us or trip us up in the process that we've covered everything in the beginning so that the project process um, from beginning to end is, is smooth going. So I'm going to guess it's not going to bring it up for me, but please check out um, the website. Uh, if you go to the main homepage of the Library and Archives website, you'll see up in the menu bar, it says Imaging and Preservation Services. Or if you have this presentation, it's right there for you. So again, any, any questions for me, for Sarah, Jerry? All right. All righty, everyone. We want to thank you for the time you took out of your day to come spend the afternoon with us, um, all of you near and far. And again, don't forget about us. We're here to help. So call us with any questions. Business cards are on the left as you walk out. The examples of some of their printing are on the right as you leave. There's a, sorry, Las Vegas, you can't see them, but there is one that we did for the Nevada Indian Commission. They sent us pictures in like three or four pieces. And using Photoshop, we were able to put them together to make this magnificent final piece. So remember that when you go back. And uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Uh,